Hi, welcome, welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Joelle Mitchell and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. Before I introduce our guest and topic for the day, allow me to introduce my co-host, Alicia Pappas. How are you today, Alicia? Hi, Joelle. I'm not too bad, thank you. It's um, um, I'm coming to you from Melbourne and um, you're based in Perth, so I think we had a chat earlier this morning and you asked me how I was and I said, you know, it's just a, another day in lockdown here, so I don't even know what day we're up to. It's 240-something, um, so not much to report apart from, yeah, it's just Groundhog Day and that's it really. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine um, what that must be like. We've we've been very fortunate um, over here in WA that we haven't had to experience anything um, as as intense as that. So um, yeah, you you have my sympathy, but that's about all I can offer, unfortunately. So um, and and you stole our you grand final as well, Joel. We did. We did steal your grand final. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, listeners, that's why Jason isn't here today because he's still hungover from the... No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I think it's true. <laughs> well, he might be, but <laughs> he, he did actually manage to get tickets, so um, he was very excited about that. Um, for our um, international listeners, um, the uh, Australian Rules um, Football Grand Final was over the weekend and it's traditionally um, held in Melbourne. Um, and due to um, COVID lockdowns um, last year, it was held um, on the Gold Coast for the first time ever. Um, and this year it's, it's been held in Perth, Western Australia, which um, probably up until maybe two months ago would have been just considered an absolutely um, impossible scenario. So um, the things that happen when you're in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Just as long as it comes back next year, that's the main thing. I'm, I'm sure it will, and the, um, the the Melbourne team won, and it was a um, it's been a long time in between wins for them, I believe. Yes, it was 57 years, I think. Mm. So I don't a, actually. I was just going to say, if you walk walk around the streets of Melbourne, because that's all you can really do these days. Um, everyone was getting into the spirit of things and um, banners and balloons. So there's all the Melbourne Melbourne. Memorabilia is still up, but um, the Bulldogs memorabilia got taken down pretty much half an hour after the game. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds about right. Um, I must admit I don't actually follow the AFL, so I'm a little bit um, oblivious to all of it, but um, I, I heard the fireworks from my house um, and by all accounts it went well, so well done. Melbourne Demons, is it Demons? It is. Yes. The D's. If there's any Demons listening, congratulations on your big win. <laughs> All right, so let's um, let's introduce our guest for today. Uh, so she holds a PhD in psychology and has conducted extensive research in the area of occupational health psychology focused on workplace bullying, occupational stress and mindfulness. The research projects have been undertaken with food retailers, safety regulators, healthcare, retail and correctional services. She is a former board member of Brodie's Law Foundation and serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Occupational Health Psychology and International Journal of Stress Management. She is currently Professor of Work and Organisational Psychology within UniSA Justice and Society and the Centre for Workplace Excellence. Welcome to the podcast, Professor Michelle Tucky. Hello, it's really good to be here with you both. Um, love the topic that you address and yeah, really, really great to have a chance to talk about some things that I'm a passionate about with you. Well, it's great to have you on, Michelle. We're really, uh, really pleased to welcome you on. So before we get into the nitty gritties, Michelle, and talk about um, our topic for today, workplace bullying as an organisational problem. Um, so. Uh, bullying and incivility is a significant uh, psychosocial um, hazard and risk factor for poor mental health for, for employees. We'll start off on a lighter note. Um, we generally ask all of our podcast guests um, if they've got any favourite podcasts that they listen to. I love listening to podcasts. Yeah. yeah. What are your favourites? 
I love stories about people. So I, I'm a fan of conversations um, and no filter, which are really cool. Um, for a bit of a lightweight stuff, um, I love ladies, we need to talk. Uh, so all sorts of issues that are affecting women. And then I go down kind of like an Esther Perel line and she has a good, really good relationships podcast um, called Where Should We Begin? And a, and a good podcast about work actually called How's Work? And it's, but it's very much exploring those relationship dynamics. Um, and then a bit of science fiction um, and maybe some one-off uh, podcasts like Down the Rabbit Hole was a fantastic look at YouTube um, and the YouTube algorithm and, and where that can take you and so on. So a bit eclectic. Oh, I have to throw in some mindfulness stuff as well, like Zencast and Audio Dharma and, and so on. So yeah, I really enjoy a good podcast and, and when I'm traveling to and from work, which is actually much less often um, at the moment with the pandemic, but that's my favorite podcast listening time, you know, a great transition and buffer between, between work and home. Um, so I really like it from that point of view. Awesome. So there's some nice um, um, tips there for podcasts that we can listen to. I haven't heard about those ones, so I might um, have a listen as well. Thanks for sharing. Pleasure. So just tell us a bit about your um, professional career to date. Um, I know Joelle's just given us a bit um, of an insight. Um, so you're very esteemed in your field um, and maybe focusing on what your current role entails and looks like. Yeah, sure. So as a professor, one of my main jobs is to do research. So I see that as, you know, trying to create new knowledge that's really going to help the world. So um, I, I pretty much apply that to working conditions and quality work and more lately to really understanding, you know, workplace bullying from a risk management perspective. What is the new knowledge that's needed and how do I turn that into practical tools and practical strategies and interventions? So as a researcher, um, I feel very lucky that I don't kind of stop at writing the papers, but I take my research forward and try and apply it in organisations as well. And that's super meaningful for me um, to try and achieve that impact through what I do. So research is one of my my main activity. And that's, that's what I'm pretty much doing at the moment. Like, thankfully, there's a lot of demand for research around mental health in the workplace and better working conditions and tackling bullying. Um, but the other core part of my role is as a teacher. So teaching students who are training in psychology, um, teaching them about work and organisational psychology. And I've done some interesting things like set up a, a placement course for undergraduate psychology students to go out and, and apply their knowledge in workplaces to solve problems. Um, so that's been a rewarding part of my current role um, as well. But my interest in all of this stuff really started when I was a volunteer firefighter. So I was in the country fire service for quite a long time and I became a peer supporter. So trained in mental health support, you know, um, in the in the late 90s. And so I really started to see the impact of, you know, what going to traumatic events um, would have on my fellow crew and getting involved in supporting that angle. So I've sort of had this interest in workplace mental health right from, from those days. And then I did my own training in psychology and it just became my research focus as well. So it's been a really lovely dovetailing of, um, of different interests from different parts of my life. And I feel incredibly lucky that I get to, to do this work, this research and apply it, you know, to have a really good effect. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's really important, you know, um, when we're designing and implementing initiatives and solutions that they're evidence-based um, and they're based on research and, um, you know, really what works, not just something that's assumed might work or from someone's perspective. So that's really great that you're able to do that. Um, so I'll throw it back to Joelle. Thanks, Alicia. Um, so, Michelle, um, you were recently a board member at Brody's Law Foundation. Um, for our listeners who aren't aware of that, can you tell us a bit more about what Brody's Law is and what the foundation does? Yeah, sure. So, Brody's, the story of Brody's Law Foundation, of course, starts with Brody's story. Um, so, many of your listeners in Victoria, uh, in particular, um, but maybe right across Australia, are probably pretty familiar with Brody's story. Brody was working um, as a waitress in a Melbourne cafe. She was um, a bright young woman. She was taking a break after school and was maybe thinking about studying social work or a helping profession. She loved to help people, um, and so she'd moved out of home. She got a job in a cafe. Um, I was really, you know, looking forward to 
to being independent and so on. And she was really subjected to terrible bullying uh, in her workplace by four men in particular, colleagues. Um, the manager knew about it. They did all sorts of awful things to her while she was there, such as, you know, pour oil in her belongings and fish sauce in her hair and, um, you know, spread rumours and have insults and just the most awful treatment day to day. It was hard for her to respond. Her colleagues kind of knew about it, um, but the manager had already given the signal, you know, that we're not going to take any action here. And this is, I'm sure, an important point that we'll come back to later in the podcast, just the important role of managers. But because the manager had the attitude of take it out the back, you know, there was, she was kind of powerless to do anything about it. And eventually, not knowing how to respond, she took, took her own life. Um, and so th that's really the tragedy at the heart of, of this foundation. And the foundation is led by her parents, Damien and Ray, who I've really had the pleasure um, to, to support and to work with over a number of years um, as, as a director on the foundation. And so a way, a way of moving forward for them was to try and do something positive around this issue. You know, just seeing the really awful and the, the terrible impact that bullying can have and, and the pain that it brought um, to Brody and, and to their family. They've just channeled that into thinking we've got to do something positive about this. So the foundation is very much set up around workplace bullying prevention. And then the main way that happens is that um, Damien and Ray go and, and they share their story. So they raise awareness um, and there's, there's a big cost in, in, you know, talking about that story, but they use it as a tool to, to drive understanding and to drive change. And, and so they work in a lot of, um, in workplaces where there's young workers, where there's other vulnerabilities to bullying, you know, trying to, to raise awareness at an individual level and raise awareness as a systems level. Another really important thing that came out of their work, though, is an actual change in the laws um, in Victoria. So bullying um, is under the Stalking Act now considered a criminal offence for serious bullying. Um, and so, again, that's just another way of raising awareness and sending a signal, you know, this kind of behaviour is just wrong and it, and it doesn't belong. And now there's an actual way of tackling that through a different branch of the law in order to... Um, to get some effective change. So Brody's Law Foundation and, and Damien and Ray Panlock have been, you know, working on multiple fronts around this issue. And so, yeah, the, the change in laws um, and their workplace advocacy and awareness has, has been two, two really important streams of work. Um, and so as a, a director on that foundation, I was, I was helping guide, you know, where to put their efforts, helping bring um, information from the evidence so that they could continue to ground their work in, you know, in an evidence base. And as Alicia said you know um you know we all want to do no harm first in this place so we need to be guided by what the evidence suggests um to drive you know our good intentions about about what we do in this space mm -hmm. thanks for sharing that michelle um do you know have there been any um sort of prosecutions under that um stalking related legislation yeah i think there have been but i i think to some degree um and so this is not really my area of expertise. So just kind of putting that out there at the start. I think the regulation of bullying, whether through its work health and safety law or something like um, the Stalking Act, is just really tricky. So there's a, there's a burden of proof um, that we need to think about. There's a reasonable person test. Um, so bullying is all about, you know, action, unreasonable actions that create a risk to health and safety. Um, it doesn't include reasonable management action taken in a reasonable manner. So that's not really very black and white about what that is. It can be really hard for workers who are being bullied um, to know that it is. In Brody's case, I think it was much clearer that these behaviours, you know, did not belong and were harmful and creating harm. But being left off emails, um, excluded from meetings, being ignored in the lunchroom, given hard deadlines and the, the worst shifts and all that kind of stuff, it's it's hard, much harder to point the finger Um that this is actual bullying and it might be that this goes on for quite some time before you even start to go oh this is just not quite right and, and how do I speak up about it so I think that's an inherent challenge in this space it's an inherent challenge for organizations that want to tackle this and it's definitely uh, a challenge um, in the legal space and I've done some expert witness work um, and and I could see from my lens you know a clear pattern of bullying but 
what's documented and what's counted as reliable evidence from a legal standpoint, there can be a really different picture. Um, so in short, I think the answer is yes, that this new legislation has led um, to some action and provided another way um, for, you know, the perpetrators of these behaviours to be, you know, dealt with appropriately, but still some of these inherent barriers, you know, remain um, just because of the nature of, of bullying at work. Yeah, absolutely. And we did have the um, regulators from um, South Australia on the podcast um, quite a while ago and they were talking about the um, successful prosecution um, that they had led um, in response to a workplace bullying and that was where an apprentice was, um, among other things, set on fire as sort of part of a, mm. you know, hazing or, or whatever they wanted to call it. Um, and, yeah, again, the, the supervisor or the site manager was... Um, sort of aware of it and um, hadn't done anything to intervene. But, again, I think, you know, that the, probably the reason that that prosecution was successful was because it actually involved acts of physical violence as yeah. well. Um, you know, it, it wasn't, I guess, just the interpersonal elements of bullying um, and sometimes they, they can be the, I guess, even the more damaging because you're sort of questioning yourself as well. That is this actually just all in my head or or are they doing this on purpose? Whereas when somebody actually, you know, physically messes with, with your stuff or with your your person, um, that's, you know, that's a much clearer line, I think. Absolutely. I think, yeah, now pointing to one of the fundamental challenges around psychosocial hazards, right, they're just less visible, they're less tangible. It's hard to point to what they are and it's hard to point to their impact. And so... I think this is a, a just a fundamental challenge for getting really good understanding and really good practical solutions. Um, and so if we have to rely on it getting so extreme that people get set on fire or people take their own life, like we're really failing in actually trying to address this issue. And it's one of the reasons I focus so much on prevention. So um, let's actually create the right kind of working environment. Um, let's address the root causes, address the risk factors uh, and re just reduce, you know, the possibility that bullying can even happen in the first place um, because it can just escalate so much. Yeah. And people question themselves and then the harm is caused, you know, almost, almost when there's no way of, of going backwards and resolving that effectively. So prevention is absolutely much better than cure in, in this context. So Michelle, what are some of the risk factors that actually then lead to bullying? Yeah, bullying very much um, as I see it, but you know, according to the evidence base, it's, it's very much an organizational issue. So that's the, the, the title of this episode, oh. right? It's an organizational problem when you need to start thinking about it as such. And what that really means is that the working environment, the systems of work, um, job design, work organisation, they're really seen as the fundamental root causes of bullying. So bullying shows up in terms of um, various behaviours between people. So it, it looks like a behavioural problem. But what we know is that these behaviours are enabled and made possible um, by these, you know, deeper structures, um, just everyday ways of working, um, different aspects of job design, different aspects of leadership really, you know, say whether bullying is possible or not. Um, and, yeah, and whether it's rewarding to actually, you know, to, to, to do bullying. So for me, I think about you need some enabling conditions that make it possible and you need some motivating factors that make it attractive to, to like so having low costs, for example, or strategically positioning yourself might be a motivator. But the enabling conditions are really um, more to the point of your question, the risk factors. So what we know is in unhealthy working systems, in high stress working systems, they really are, um, you know, where the risk factors for bullying are found. When job demands are really high, um, such as workloads, uh, but also demands like um, lack of role clarity. So just having really unclear boundaries around your role and your scope of work. Um, having a lot of demands around bureaucracy and, and red tape. Um, when those things increase, the likelihood of bullying increases too. And having low, what we call job resources. So that might be the tangible resources you need to do your work, computers and equipment and people and budget and time. Um, or it might be what we call psychological resources like job control and social support. So 
the, to the extent that you don't have those things, um, the likelihood of bullying increases. So it's kind of like they create a bit of a melting pot um, in a stressful system that eventually shows up um, in terms of these, you know, conflicts and interactions that can become bullying. In my work in particular, I've focused on what I call work organisation practices. So how are we bringing people and tasks um, together? How are we structuring things through rosters and schedules, um, through allocating tasks and workload, through providing the right kind of training and career progression? And how do we manage the performance of staff and appraise it and reward it and manage their underperformance? And do we just have a really safe climate around mental health and a safe, physically safe working environment? I'm kind of focused on, on those things um, because they're things that we can change if we understand how rosters and scheduling might be used in the bullying process or her, around um, allocating tasks and so on, we can actually unpack that and we can address it and we can make concrete changes. So, so going back to what we were saying before, trying to get some more con concreteness, trying to get some clearer practical options for how we might address those risk factors. So yeah, it sounds like bullying, um, is loaded upon by other risk factors. It's not just, um, you know, a risk in itself. It's not just a behavior in itself. There's other factors, work-related factors that contribute to bullying or make it more likely. Absolutely. Yep. And so as well as focusing on the behavior of bullying, and that's why policies and training, um, codes of conduct and investigations, they're all really important because they, they look directly at bullying behavior. They say it's not on um, and they attempt to remedy it when it's happening. Uh -huh. We've got to actually go to that deeper layer as well. And we've got to design, well, I think we have the opportunity to design our bullying from workplaces by looking um, to these, these root causes. If you think about an iceberg, you know, the bullying behavior is what we can see. It's above the surface. It's what shows up. It might show up on our culture surveys um, and so on. But below the surface are these, you know, these ways of working, the work organization, um, these job demands and resources and so on. They're the things that create the conditions around whether or not bullying can occur in the first place. So if we start at that deeper level and then we back it up by having those um, strategies that focus on behavior, then we have like a comprehensive anti-bullying system in organizations. So we really need both parts. We need the parts that focus on the behavior and the parts, the parts that focus on the environment um, and, and how they come together. And can you shed some light on the prevalence of bullying in the workplace, um, whether you've got some um, prevalent statistics in Australia or mm -hmm. um, around the world? Yeah, look, Australia doesn't have great um, prevalence data, but we have had a national survey in 2009 to 11 and, and again in 2014 to 15. And so that's called the Australian Workplace Barometer. It's actually uh, run out of the Centre for Workplace Excellence, which is my home research. So um, at least we have two good data points, you know, nationally representative looking right across the country. Um, so the last survey in 2014-15 showed that we had 9.7% um, exposure to bullying in the last six months um, across the country. That's using a pretty strict um, definition. Actually, there was a definition from the academic literature, but also the Safe Work Australia definition. And, you know, one was 9.4 and one was 9.7%. So pretty close correspondence between those definitions. Gone up from 7% in 2009 to 2011. So it's interesting to think about whether we've got more bullying or whether just people feel safer to report bullying in, in, in Australia at the moment. Mm -hmm. But the other interesting thing about those definitions is that um, we were able to look at the uh, data from the European Working Conditions Survey. So try and get a bit of a benchmark. Is this a high rate? Is this a low rate? At the time in when we did that in 2009, um, with the rate of six out of um, compared to 34 EUs, by the time we'd resurveyed into 2014-15, uh, that rate of 9.4 or 9.7%, that's actually at the top. So it was greater than all those historical rates of RPN survey. So, like we, you know, there's a few problems with that wholly as a conclusion, like we would need to go to more recent data and so on. But if we put um, those concerns aside, we can pretty much say that Australia has a reasonably high level of bullying, um, you know, comparatively internationally. And so it's really an issue that we 
need to um, pay attention to. There's a lot of cost to society. The Productivity Commission estimated up to $36 billion every year to our economy from this issue, um, from all sorts of costs. So our, our level of exposure and our level of cost to our businesses um, and our people, more importantly, um, means we've got to pay a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, what you're saying is, um, you know, the prevalence rates in Australia are quite high comparatively to other countries. Um, do you have any insights as to why that might be? Uh, not really, not any really clear ones. Um, it, the interesting thing, had bullying on the horizon. So um, we had a parliamentary inquiry um, we've had it before the harmonised legislation, like bullying was explicitly in the South Australian safety legislation. Um, it's not so explicitly in, yeah. under our harmonised work health and safety laws, but I think the attention to psychosocial hazards um, in Australia has, has been increasing and there's an increasing appetite um, to grapple with them and increasing awareness. So, so it could be a factor around that. Bullying always relies on power. So I, I'm wondering about power dynamics. We don't have particularly high, um, you know, power structures in Australia compared to other countries. Um, so I think, so yeah, I don't, I don't have a clear answer. It's a, it's a complex multi-causal phenomenon bullying. It requires, you know, thinking about how a lot of different factors um, come together. Uh, and as I said, the factors that I think about most are really creating a safe work environment um, through the organisational systems and, and working practices and kind of focusing on getting that right, creating a robust system um, in, order, in order to protect people from bullying. So um, I guess look, looking at that, um, what are some evidence-based strategies organisations can put in place to actually prevent bullying so addressing those um those i guess leading factors yeah i think that's really where the gap is uh in a practical sense in organizations so um, a good foundation around strategies that focus on behavior so having a great policy in place and a way of making it um reporting bullying um and investigating it having bullying awareness training and so on so the gap that I see is really in, okay, what are we doing directly to address those risk factors? And Safe Work Australia's guidance is really clear that, you know, a risk management cycle can be used and should be used to address psychosocial hazards uh, like bullying, just as it should be used to address physical hazards. So I very much think there's an opportunity for organisations to think about bullying as a work health and safety hazard and, and approach it as such using a risk management framework. So this would start by looking at the nature and level of risk and in a particular organisation, what, what are those um, factors around your job design, around your working practices that are where bullying might come in? Um, then once that's understood, um, actually, you know, working with your staff to think about what the solutions um, might be. So we can call them, you know, what control measures do we need to have in place? And then reviewing and evaluating those control measures, making their working, uh, making sure they're working as planned. And, and then that risk management cycle um, can start again. So, so there's good guidance material um, from Safe Work Australia uh, at a broad level around, you know, using that risk management cycle to address bullying. And this is also pretty consistent with the literature on organisational interventions. So there's quite a lot of literature on um, interventions to protect the mental health and wellbeing um, of staff. And they all say to say to follow that same kind of problem solving cycle. So it would begin with preparation and, and be clear that we're gonna do an intervention and that we have priority and resources go to that. Then it should start with a risk assessment. Um, we should always have an intelligence led intervention. Um, so gather some data, use a risk management survey or some other kind of um, tool then we have some kind of co-design or participatory approach that involves, you know, workers right up to senior leaders actually working with the data and deciding on what the solutions are, um, implement them and evaluate that. So the principles are, are, are very similar between work health and safety risk management and between, you know, the established approach to organisational intervention. So I really think fundamentally that's, that's what's missing and that's where the opportunity lies for organisations to do something differently um, in this space. 
Yeah, so I mean, what we always um, strongly recommend to our clients is that, you know, once they've actually done that initial sort of screening to say, right, well, these are the hazards that are present in the workplace, you need to do a lot more consultation to understand, you know, what are the what are the triggers that are causing those hazards to actually manifest into risk. So I think, um, yeah, when you're looking at bullying, it's one of those classic ones where, you know, okay, well, we've got a, a policy about bullying and we've got a code of conduct um, and we've got you know, training for people um, and then we've got a, you know, a complaints process and an investigations process and then a, you know, whatever um, disciplinary outcome is deemed appropriate depending on, you know, the investigation findings. Um, but, yeah, none of that really gets to what's actually driving mm. the bullying behaviour. It's all about the behaviour um, in and of itself sort of as an individual person who's choosing to engage in that behaviour rather than looking at what are the workplace factors that are actually potentially triggering this behaviour. Absolutely. You're spot on. And so, yeah, the survey is just um, a guide where to look. So it kind of, you know, the survey, the data, whatever you want to call it, shows us, okay, we need to look over here. Um, and the consultation piece is just is just vital. So there's really good evidence in my in my own work, but also in the broader literature. Um, that consultation and participation in itself is an intervention. You are giving workers control. You are giving them a voice. This can have positive effects regardless of any other solutions or strategies um, you come up with. But more than that, you need it. You need their insights. You know, people are experts around their own work. They're experts in their own workplace. Um, and they can build on the data that you have from a good, reliable survey tool. Um, so as you say, identify what those triggers are, unpack what's actually going on, and then your solutions can target those true underlying causes that are coming together to show up as bullying or to show up as absenteeism or strain or burnout or a whole lot of other, you know, ways that these same underlying causes can, can show up and really um, affect workers and workplaces. Um, just, I guess, another... Um observation I think that, that I've made and I'm interested in your views on it um, you know if we look at um, for example the Fair Work Act definition of bullying and that it ex excludes um, you know reasonable management action undertaken in a reasonable way um, I guess I've observed sort of situations where you know a performance management or a performance re review or appraisal system um, can sort of be used almost as a way to legitimise bullying from, from a supervisor because of the ambiguity that's built in to the performance appraisal structure, um, that it can be actually quite easy for a supervisor to use that as a way to actually um, bully a subordinate whilst under the guise of it being reasonable management action. Did you have any thoughts on that? Oh, my, sh my short thought is agree. <laughs> that can happen and I've seen it. Um, my longer answer is... Um, to kind of contextualise it in some evidence, we actually looked at 342 bullying complaints lodged with Safe Work SA, the local regulator here, had them de-identified and transcribed and released for analysis. And um, out of all of those, 42%, I think, were on, on this exact issue. What is the overlap between performance management process and bullying? So for organisations, this is the biggest risk area for potential perceptions of bullying or actual bullying. So it's if there's one thing that organisations could do to make a difference, they could tighten up the way that performance um, management is done. Um, you're right, the, the systems give a lot of leeway to be used um, and the manager is holding the power in, in this sense. So to use that power um, as a way of control and influence on, on a staff member um, in, in a way that would be regarded as bullying, but would be very difficult to be unmasked um, as bullying. And that's where I think the consultation piece is evidence, like in evident um, relevant is if you, if you know that that's a risk area, work together with workers um, and leaders to actually redesign what that would look like um, to get rid of the opportunities for that power imbalance um, and more to the point to provide some positive opportunities for that process to be used in a really good way, um, not just sort of in a punitive or controlling way. So it's a, yeah, it's the number one biggest risk area for bullying in, in terms of the evidence um, that, that we've um, been looking at. 
Thank you. That that would actually be, I would love to see an organisation um, get their workforce involved in actually designing the performance appraisal process. That would be a, a beautiful thing to see. Yeah, agree. <laughs> so um, it's been great to hear from a risk management perspective, um, the ways to go about, um, you know, identifying and addressing um, the factors that might then lead to bullying and um, flowing on from that um, employee mental ill health, um, if there is bullying identified in a workplace, so just say that it happens, um, either an employee comes forward and um, reports it or it's observed by somebody else and it's raised, what should um, the employer do in that situation? Yeah, this is a really good question. And we've talked a bit already about strategies that focus on the behaviour. So they're almost non-negotiable ingredients to have now, you know, policies, training, a safe way of reporting and taking action. What I think I really is useful to highlight here is that the action that's taken sends a really strong signal to staff around, um, around bullying and around their mental health. So if meaningful act is not taken or if that's invisible and this is really tricky with bullying you know the confidentiality and so on then your staff might get the idea that bullying's okay around here and that can actually inadvertently open up more bullying um, and more believed in action and, and really create a downward spiral within all, an organization so that signaling element um, is really important. Conversely, if bullying is handled early and handled well, it sends a safety signal to staff. They know that the organization really cares. They know bullying is something that is not tolerated um, in the organization. And so they'll be more likely to bring stuff up early. Uh, it's more able to be resolved if it's brought up early. Um, so yeah, don't underestimate the power of the signaling. Um, and while I've talked a lot already around, you know, those very root causes, I think another gap in organisations is um, early intervention mechanisms. So one really good example is peer messengering. So this is something that's starting to be looked at um, in medicine now in particular. So this might be training a cohort of peer messengers and there's a, a confidential reporting system and, and there's a triage process. And then... Um, depending on what it is, a peer messenger goes and talks to the staff member and, um, you know, says, hey, okay, this happened yesterday. Tell us, tell us what's going on, you know. So approaching it both from the point of view that the behaviour is um, not okay, but recognising that that behaviour is, you know, becoming manifest maybe because of the stressful work environment and the consequences. And so if you're getting those messages across early, um, you're building awareness, you're building ways of resolving it. So I think there's a big gap there. We've got these behaviour focused um, policies and procedures. Um, we know there's a need to look at the root causes, but what's in the middle in terms of early intervention? And I'd really love organisations to think about that. Once, once a bullying case is escalated formally, it's very hard to de-escalate it. It's very hard to get a good solution to repair the relationships um, you know, that process of an investigation can actually um, create a lot more harm um, to individuals, but also to the relationships. Um, so yeah, early intervention is really important. Um, and I think thirdly, just taking on the idea that bullying is an organisational problem and thinking about that in their response. So this behaviour is a bit of a signal that something's going on that we need to change in the environment. So not just about proving whether or not the behaviour happened. Um, and we've already talked about the challenges of doing that in the bullying space, but actually saying, look, this is some intelligence that I have now about this working system. There's some elements of this working system that aren't healthy, that aren't functioning well if it's showing up in this kind of behaviour. So actually, you know, giving everyone a bit of space to move um, by framing it um, in that way and by looking at it in that way and seeing it as a chance to improve um, the work environment. Of course, targets need to be supported properly um, and cases need to be handled properly, but particularly at an early stage before things escalate you know, taking a view to the environment and actually using that as a trigger to go and do your risk assessment, to go and do your risk management cycle um, before things um, become harmful. I think, you know, those are the three three of the gaps that they could really be um, good opportunities for organisations. 
Yeah, I love what you said there about um, early intervention and it's, you know, you'll get a better outcome if you approach the issue earlier before it gets to that investigative process um, because you're right and in my experience as well when it gets to that point it's almost like the damage is being done and, and it's formal and it's you know when you're saying early intervention um, it's important for organizations to think about you know what does that actually look like when we're talking about resolving interpersonal issues um, and it's this more informal process versus a formal process because that's often um, missed there's no informal process to have discussions and um, what you said about the peer messengers that's that's a that's an informal structure that can have a really good outcome um, that's missing in a lot of organizations so thanks yeah. for sharing that insight no, absolutely um another one is assertive covenant conversation training so i think it was the new south wales ambulance service perhaps that um has tried that out. So that might be another opportunity to empower people around having their own assertive conversations and create the norm and a structure for how we might have conversations about tricky workplace issues in a way that can lead to a resolution. So it doesn't need, it doesn't need to escalate. So yeah, really good to, and I'd love to see more research in that space so we can have more evidence-based. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and how to actually promote reporting, promote coming forward and to view that yeah. as a positive rather than as, um, you know, something that might be frowned upon or you're just causing issues. Yeah, exactly. There's a, there's an effective um, evidence-based intervention around um, incivility, actually, which relies on having weak things for intense, you know, incidents of incivility are discussed um, at these meetings and how they arise from the context. And so that would be one forum to establish this kind of mechanism in, in an informal sense that could handle a lot of these issues uh, along the way. I mean, the drawbacks is, yeah, it's very intensive and you have to be quite skilled, I think, to facilitate those meetings. But it just illustrates this principle that we're talking about, that to the extent that we can early um, and we can tackle it and confront it in a positive solutions-focused way, I think, yeah, we've got a much better recipe. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. So, oh, sorry, Joel. No, that's all right, Alicia. Go ahead. Um, so I was just going to um, um, go back to your point, Michelle. Earlier, you mentioned the the importance of um, managers in and their role in, I suppose, preventing and addressing bullying. Um, I've, I've found historically um, that. When the, when the bullying is between manager and employee, um, it makes it tricky for the employee to raise this issue for fear of how they might be um, judged or what that might mean for their, um, you know, role or career, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what happens when there's that power structure um, and what should employees be doing I suppose um, to address that issue if they don't feel comfortable if it's their manager yeah. it's a really important question um, so you know there's various forms of power in organizations and managers are holding the formal power and so to some degree there's a dependency there you know employees are more vulnerable because of that power and we see this really clearly um, again, in medicine, as an example, and the Royal Australasian of College of Surgeons has done a lot of work on this. Um, it sort of says it's a really good illustration that it's so hard for junior training doctors to raise something because they feel like their careers are on the line. They feel like they could be uh, blacklisted if they bring things up. Um, and surgeons are seen as being so valuable to the business of the hospital that they're almost untouchable. Um, and so these, um, these power dynamics are really important. But the other piece that's come out of that work that I think is, is relevant to the broader issue is that, you know, managers don't always necessarily have um, people management skills that might not be you know, promoted into that kind of role based on their operational competencies or their technical expertise. Um, but as I've talked about, you know, a lot of the risks of bullying arise when, you know, people and tasks are not managed and coordinated and organised well. And so that um, is, a, is a fundamental issue in, in all the work that I do. I think one of the most common 
stories is that you know, managers are in working in roles where they don't always have um, the people management skills, the, the you know the technical management skills over and above their other their other skills. Sets. And so that combined with the power imbalance means that they, they might actually be, you know, not delivering their management as well as they could. And, and that might feel like or actually be like bullying. And then because of the power dynamics, you get a situation where people um, can't speak up. There was one structure actually um, that talked with managers um, accused of bullying. And so there's, there's very little research on this, but there was 22 managers accused of bullying. Um, they all agreed they'd used unreasonable behaviours. Like it's, it can be difficult as a manager not to set an unreasonable deadline, not to pass down some of the pressure of the organisation onto your staff. But what these managers talked about was just being at a different pressure point in the organisational system. They're really describing their own lack of role clarity, their own very high demands. Um, they're describing some of the actual practices of the organization that they have to deliver as a manager as being what led to the bullying so they're being in a really hard um, position so for me it's just pointing out that the systems you know the working systems the safe ways of working and managers are just a different point almost in the hot seat actually um, in organizations so I think managers need to just recognize that that what they do and how they do it um, with their staff really is creating opportunities for bullying or not. It might be perceived as bullying directly by their staff um, or it might create uh, opportunities for others to bully so that if they can increase their management and leadership skills and they can ways that, you know, around allocating tasks and workload, around having clear roles for um, jobs, um, that's really important. Uh, getting workers involved is really important um, for managers. So that consultation piece, again, don't feel like you have to go it alone as a manager, you know, recognise and draw on the expertise. And um, that's a really been a really nice thing coming out of the inter work, intervention work that I've done. The managers involved say now, wow, I can just work differently with my staff. It's, it's not all on my shoulders. Um, when I have a problem to solve, I take it to the team and the team come up with solutions. Now we're just creating a different culture um, ways of working. For employees, though, who might be experiencing bullying from a manager, this is one of the hardest situations um, to begin with because that power imbalance is likely what is sustaining the bullying. So um, recognising that early is really important. Um, going outside that power structure, so talking to a trusted colleague or talking to HR, um, a bullying contact officer or getting some other advice. So what other power can you bring to bear? Like if you're an employee that, that can help you withstand the bullying. Uh, um, just calling it out. I, I was, I've been bullied um, before at work and um, I was a very um, young academic, new academic at the time. Um, and someone was kind of bullying me behind closed quarters would come past my office and different things. And, there was an opportunity in a meeting to call it out one day um, to just kind of point out, oh, yeah, so remember when you came past my office and you said that last week, you know, it kind of connected to the issue at hand and I took that opportunity to, to call that out and that ended up shifting the power dynamic. And so somehow shining a light on what was going on, not through these bullying complainisms, but just trying to shift that power dynamic. It's very hard because it's an organisational issue and because it's very hard, therefore, to shift the organisational ecosystem. It puts employees who are being bullied in a really tough spot. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, um, so let's talk a little bit more then about line managers. So we do, we do talk a lot on this podcast about, I guess, the, the critical role of line managers in um, sort of protecting the, the psychological health and safety of the team members. Yeah. Um, if we're looking at bullying prevention and assuming that the line manager isn't the one who's perpetrating the bullying behaviour, yeah. um, so you've talked a little bit about, about what, they can, what they can do. Do you have um, some more sort of examples or um, maybe a, um, a case study or something that you can share? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm doing a lot of work in supermarkets at the moment, uh, 70 supermarkets, and um, especially now in COVID times with lockdowns, panic buying and so on, there's incredible demands there. So we really have a really stressful organisational system. Um, and what tends to come up in, when we do our risk assessment surveys there is things around base training. 
um, things around recognition and rewarding performance and um, tasks and workloads. So we think, okay, what do we do when we explore these domains? And so the, the story that we hear is that um, if people don't come in with the right training, then they can't do the work efficiently. Um, then there might be an underperformance problem that needs to be addressed. But we're also busy trying to deliver <laughs> the stock demands and so on under COVID that we can't actually slow down and help people to, to lift their performance. And besides, all we get is negative feedback. We don't get any positive feedback anyway. So I think it's kind of knowing what those drivers are and recognising how they come together as a melting pot, as a system to show up as bullying or just to show up to affect um, mental health. So managers can kind of be aware that, you know, it's these underlying, you know, building blocks or ingredients of, of, of good management and of good workplaces, if they can work with staff to actually, you know, change some of those and that, then, then they can make a really big difference. So the recognition piece, it'd be talking to staff, you know, what kind of feedback would you like? Um, what's meaningful to you? in terms of recognition. Uh, is it is it individual? Um, is it something that we do collectively? Is it recognizing really outstanding performance or is it just actually wanting, you, you know, recognition for doing consistent work to deliver consistent high quality work and not these standout achievements? So I think I'm really saying, have some conversations with your staff, make, you know, addressing these things an important part of your role as a manager. It, it's not an add-on that comes later, but these are the ways of setting up your ways of working and your team's way of working that actually have flow on effects for really good productivity, but for mental health and wellbeing and things like bullying and burnout and stress as well. So know what those are and actually find the time to invest in that and do that in a way that you work together with your staff. That will go a long way um, uh, a really long way actually to, to starting a really positive change in your team. So what would you say to those um, to, to those managers out there who say, well, I pay my employees to do their job, they get paid to do their job and if they're doing it satisfactorily, I don't need to give them any feedback because they're getting paid. I mean, you can take that view, but that's a very transactional view. Um, and people are human. You know, a, a straight money transaction meets some of our really basic needs to survive. It doesn't enrich us as people. It doesn't lift us up to our, our best potential. There might be some people that don't want any more from the workplace, but there's a lot of people that do. So, you know, in order to have really high quality work, people want a sense of meaning. They want some feedback around how they're going. They want to know that they're doing some and that they're making a difference and so if that's missing then they're missing one of the most vital ingredients for feeling good and thriving at work so I would say that approach is more about surviving if you want people to come to work and survive then take the position that you know we can pay them and that's it if you want them to thrive then you've got to focus on you know these elements around meaning and responsibility and, and feedback and using that to lift people up and help them become their best yeah, so you're actually talking there about about providing that positive feedback as a um, as a as a resource for for mental health. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, a resource and a reinforcer um, and a foundation for growth. All of that thing, all of those things. Yeah, mm. positive leadership versus just that transactional approach. Um, absolutely, and this is a risk factor for bullying in the research. We know that various forms of positive leadership, whether it's ethical leadership or transformational leadership or authentic leadership, consistently there's less bullying in work groups that have those kind of leadership. And the reverse pattern is true. You know, there's various negative leadership styles, whether that just be a laissez-faire style where there's just a lack of leadership or actual destructive leadership patterns, there's much higher levels of bullying and stress. And so really concrete evidence about that um, in the literature. So um, in terms of any other factors that we haven't talked about yet, is there anything that comes to mind when we're talking about um, workplace bullying that employers should consider? Any other factors? Yeah, something I've been thinking a lot about lately um, with the Me Too movement, with the Respect at Work report, is this the role of gender? So I think pretty much bullying is seen as a gender neutral 
issue, but I, I'm really starting to think about whether or not that's the case. And so like it or not, um, we have various stereotypes around um, what behaviour is okay for people of different genders. And I think one of the ways that can show up in, in bullying most obviously is in terms of responses. So if a, if a man's being bullied at work, you know, what might be stereotypically okay for them is to, to have a more assertive, you know, response to that. Um, is it really okay for women to take the same kind of assertive response? So if we're thinking about early intervention, do men and women have the same opportunities to respond? Um, or are women more likely to be silenced just because that's the way that women's behaviour is perceived? So I think this is an incredibly complex area, but uh, and I guess I'm just really a call to action to start actually thinking about, okay, in addition to your working practices and structures, how might gender... Um, come into it likewise you know having pre precarious employment contracts that's a real risk factor for bullying you know creates that dependency there that you can't speak up um in case your hours get docked or you, you, you know you lose your casual employment and a lot of women are in that space too much more likely to be working um in, in terms of precarious work so i think there's some really important intersections there um, I think about the connection between bullying and sexual harassment. So sexual harassment is also a psychosocial hazard and how I, might we be able to approach um, these two sets of behaviours together as psychosocial hazards in a, a really coordinated risk management sense. I think there'll be more appetite um, to start looking at this in Australian organisations, kind of recognising that both of these sets of behaviour can really have a significant impact um, on workers and on the work environment uh, as well. Yeah, we've got a, um, I think it's a, it's a parliamentary inquiry into sexual harassment in the FIFO um, working environment happening in, um, in WA at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, yes, I think the, you know, the, the common factors there are power dynamics. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, I guess the perceptions of... Um, appropriate behaviour for, for men and women in the workplace and um, gender sort of balance in terms of the makeup yeah. of the workplace as well and how that can impact um, perceptions of what behaviours are acceptable or, or not. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, tightening up our organisational systems, making them more robust, making them more mentally healthy. This is going to help with all types of power imbalance and the behaviours that flow. In the sexual harassment space, there's this additional gender element, like you say, in the gender makeup of the workforce and how those dynamics play out. But as a really good starting point, you know, this, this risk management of those root causes that allow power to be used in um, unhealthy rather than healthy ways, it's a really good place to start um, in this space as well, I think. And that, I think that power issue um, is so underrepresented in a lot of organisational research, um, mm -hmm. but it's it's such an important aspect of it. And I think that it, you know, it underpins a lot of these psychosocial hazards, that those issues of power and, um, and hierarchy and how all of it interacts and, you know, influences sort of reward and recognition throughout organisations and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but now I'm, I'm taking us on a side quest, which is probably <laughs> not advantageous it's given the podcast. amount of time we've had. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, you've given us um, some really excellent things to think about um, and really widened, I think, the, the lens um, in terms of how we can look at workplace bullying and really thinking outside of it, just being a problem with an individual player and really looking at what are those what are those wider factors that can actually um, trigger those behaviours in the first place. So um, I hope that um, that the listeners have um, got some light bulb moments um, from from this um, this episode. I know that I certainly have. Um, looking ahead to the future, what would you say that your hopes are for the future of workplace mental health, and in particular how bullying is is addressed? Yeah, that's a nice question to end on. Um, look, I, I'd love mental health to be recognised um, as important in its own right, as valued in its own right. Like it's a holistic concept. It's about being able to withstand the pressures of life. It's a be about being able to 
you know, make a great contribution to the community. It's just about being able to have a, a meaningful life. So to see it as important in its own right and to understand um, in terms of workplaces that we have a responsibility to create mentally healthy work environments, um, not just to deal with mental health problems that emerge, not just to build up the strengths and, um, you know, offer things like yoga and, and wellness and so on. We actually need to recognise that work places and working conditions are risk factors um, for poor mental health but are also opportunities to build positive mental health and so really you know valuing mental health in its own right and recognize environments if we can get that happening and that integrated into day-to-day -day business operations um, yeah I would think that's a pretty good pretty good goal to aim for and one, fi one final question you mentioned, um, you know, you're working with um, or involved in the training of organisational psychology um, students at, you know, masters and above level at the moment. Um, we've got various listeners to our podcast from students to HR professionals, health and safety professionals, um, you know, management leaders. What would you um say to anyone that's looking to work in this field specifically psychological health and safety any um, words of advice oh that's a really good question for me I always come back to you know organizations are ecosystems so it's very much taking an ecosystem framing what's showing up in an organization um, you know is, is not the whole story dig deeper find out what are the parts of the ecosystem that are connected? How can we start to change parts of that e ecosystem um, as, as, a, as a system in a holistic way? Because that's where um, you're going to have the most success. And secondly, you know, workers are a valuable asset to you in your work. So don't forget about the, the importance of consultation. Um, actually, you know, take the time to slow down in order to speed up. So really connect in with staff, engage with them. That has benefits in and of itself, but it will help you um, solve problems more quickly. Yeah, really involve your staff in coming up with the solutions. And you're right, it takes more time. And people, yeah. oh, I don't have time to do this or they, um, I don't know, really know how to do this or, you know, what's the way forward. Um, but if you do use your staff in the process um, yep. they value it and you will um, gain from it as well absolutely yep really well said so michelle um, for any of our our listeners out there who are maybe um in an organization and thinking hey i really want to do something in this space um and are maybe looking for a you know an opportunity to collaborate in some research some applied research how can they get in touch with you um, my email, michelle.tucky at unisa.edu.au. Look for the Centre for Workplace Excellence at the University of South Australia. Um, yeah, connect with I mean, either of those ways. I'd be really happy to talk about the work we've been doing um, to make this sustaining, uh, sustainable deep change in organisations on these root cause risk factors. Wonderful. All right, listeners, so um, that brings us to the end of the episode. Um, I hope Alicia and I managed to uh, keep you entertained without Jason here. Um, <laughs> um, so don't forget that um, if you want to have a look at the videos of us and um, in, in all of our um, home or office-based glory, depending on where we are located, um, you can check out our um, Flourish DX channel on YouTube um, or, of course, we always publish the, um, the short two to four minute videos on LinkedIn. Um, you can also connect directly with Alicia or myself on LinkedIn. Um, and we're always happy to, to have a chat um, about what we're doing. Um, so feel free to do that. So that's it for this episode, listeners, and we will catch you next time. <laughs>